in the first session all the way through God's plan of salvation. We want to pick up today and continue on page 16 in the book, God's Plan for Man. God's plan for man includes assurance of his salvation. When I say his, I'm talking about God's salvation which is given to man. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. We pray that you'll bless the message, bless the reading of your word. And we just ask, Lord, to help us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, God does not want you to hope that you're saved. He actually wants you to know it. God does not want you to think that you're saved. He wants you to know it. And God does not want you to feel like you're saved. God wants you to know that you're saved. Now thank God we have proof of the fact that God has given us eternal life and that He wants you and I to know it. Let us share this good news with you. By the way, it is a fact that God has given us eternal life and this life is in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You say us, preacher? Those of us that have trusted in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus for the payment of our sins. In the Bible, in John 3.36, it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Yes, it is a fact that God wants you and I to know that we have everlasting life. John 5.24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Another verse in the Bible that comes to mind is John 6.37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. You have the word of Jesus Christ, that he will not cast you out. Now this is our security, the security, the Lord Jesus Christ. Over in 1 John, there's a record written in the Bible that proves that those that have trusted in Jesus have eternal life. We have the word of God to back this up. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So there beyond a shadow of a doubt, God is telling us that we have eternal life. God's record of eternal life. And we should praise the Lord for the real gift of life, and that is eternal life. Now if you receive Christ as your Savior, you may want to write us and share the good news of your salvation with us, and we'll pray for your spiritual growth as a new Christian. You can write to Albany Rescue Mission, Incorporated, 604 North Monroe Street, Albany, Georgia, 31701. Now, now that you're saved, those that have trusted the Lord, you might be asking yourself, what's next? That's a good question. Now we most certainly live in a day of religious confusion, especially when it comes to the different Christian beliefs that are practiced by various denominations and their churches. However, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 14.33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Now most churches claim to have the truth, but the Bible is plain in this area. John 14.6 says this, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's what Jesus said. Nobody comes to the Father unless they go through the Son. You must also remember Jesus said in Matthew 15, 9, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now the next section of this book was prepared to show us what God expects us to do after we have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation. Now keep in mind, the final authority is God's holy word, the Bible. 
If you don't believe that, you're going to have a big problem. Amen. You can't come to the Bible and say, well, I think maybe part of this is right. Folks, it's all right or get rid of it. Amen. I mean, I don't have, you know, there's no compromising on this. You either believe it or find one you do believe. Amen. Now, keep in mind, the final authority is the Word of God. Not the preacher. Not my mama. Not anybody. The Word of God. Amen. Now, it says in Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. The key to this is faith. But you'll never get that faith without hearing the Word of God. People are trying to do that without listening to the Word of God. It's not going to get done. As the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now, going into part two of our book, the title you see there on page 19, it says, In Search of the Right Church. I believe everybody would like to say, well, I wish I could get to the right church. I would like to serve God where He wants me to serve. Amen. Now, this is God's plan for man after He receives the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And He's been given assurance of His salvation by the Word of God. James 1.22 But be ye doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now the first thing the Lord wants you to do is to confess Him before men and follow Him in scriptural baptism. Now that you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you may be asking, what is next? And as, obedient, as an obedient Christian, you will want to do as the Lord commands. Now it says in Romans 10.10, 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then it says in Matthew 10, 32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Now, your baptism, your profession of faith and baptism should be made in a local, Bible-preaching, Bible-believing, New Testament church. If you were saved outside of a church, and many people were saved outside of a church. If you were saved outside of a church and you're not sure where to go, you ought to do this. You ought to just stop. And immediately, you ought to pray and ask the Lord to help you find the church He wants you to serve Him in. Not the church you want to serve in. Did you hear that? Pay attention to that now. What you ought to do is get on your knees and say, Lord, you send me where you want me and give me the wisdom to know it. Amen? Now, this church should be a Christ-honoring, Bible-preaching, Bible-believing, a sin-hating, a witnessing, soul-winning, missionary-minded church. If it's not, you're wasting your time. As far as God's concerned. Amen? Keep in mind now when we use the word man in this writing, we're referring to mankind, men, women, and children. God used the male gender when he addresses the human race in the Bible. He's not being prejudiced here against women or children or anything like that. Amen. Now, you ought to, you ought to check this church out. This church should be a church that has a friendly, warm atmosphere. You should feel comfortable with the pastor or the preacher and other believers in this church. Pray and ask the Lord to help you find the church that He wants you in. Now folks, listen. Avoid any church that does not teach and preach salvation by the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ for our sins plus nothing, minus nothing. We are saved by grace alone. Amen. And avoid any church that mixes works with God's grace. Now you should not join a church that teaches any of these following unscriptural doctrines. Number one, if you run into a church that teaches that you can lose your salvation, that means your salvation is dependent on how holy you are and what you do. You've got a problem. You need to get out of it. You don't need to join that church. And there are churches out there that teach you've got to hold on and keep it and work it up and do this and do that. Now, it is very important that you join a church that puts the Lord Jesus Christ first and not the preacher. 
Let me run that and buy again. Did you hear that? Make sure that you join a church that puts the Lord Jesus Christ above all. Amen. Now, John 6, 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. Here, is Jesus mentions this again. We put it in here the second time because I think it's very important. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. That's what Jesus said. And him that cometh to me, that means receives Christ as Savior, I will in no wise what? He said there's no reason that he'll never cast you out. He said, well, oh, wait a minute, preacher. You don't mean to tell. I get this all the time. I don't know why they always want to hang this on Baptists for some reason. Because uh, independent, fundamental Bible-believing Baptists believe once saved, always saved. There's no other way. But then you know what they'll tell you? They say, you Baptists, you think you've got a license to go out and live like hell. And you can do anything you want to and you're not going to lose your salvation. Let me say something to you. I could go out tonight and get drunk. You pray I don't. And no, I would not lose my salvation. But let me tell you what I would lose. My testimony. Amen. My joy. I'd break my fellowship with God. And when I showed back up here at the mission, it wouldn't be the same after you heard the reports that Brother Larry got drunk downtown. You saw him with your own eyes. Now you said, well, did Brother Larry lose his salvation? No. He didn't lose his salvation, but he did lose his testimony. And the respect that you had for me went down the drain too. Now those things can be gotten back, but you don't never lose eternal life. God may have to kill you and take you to heaven. Amen. But you never get on saved. Once you trust him, you're his child. We need to get that cleared up before we go any further, because a lot of people have a problem with that area. Amen. Now, remember anyone who adds works onto God's plan of salvation is actually teaching false doctrine. Number two, avoid any church that teaches that in order to be saved, you must do the best you can, hold out, live a good life, get baptized, speak in tongues, or receive the so-called baptism. Now, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through what? Faith. And that not of yourself. It is the what? Gift of God. Amen. You didn't work for it. God gave it to you. Amen. Not of works lest any man should boast. God don't want you walking up and saying, Hey, I, I go to church. I've been in the church since I've been to the little boy. I read my Bible every day. And aren't you proud of me, God? Wait a minute now. What are you saying when you say that? Are you saying that's why you think you're going to heaven? Because you're holy? That you're trying to hold on? You're reading your Bible? Hey, you got saved, listen, to do good works, not by doing good works. Amen. All right. Titus 3, 5 is another good verse on this, by the way. It says, not by the works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now, once you've found the church the Lord wants you to serve him in, you need to make public your profession of faith and follow him in scriptural baptism. Now, number three in this order, what to look out for in a church. Beware of any church that over, now I stress this, overemphasizes the gifts in the Bible. Healings, tongues, signs, wonders, miracles, and the baptism. When I say that, that's being baptized with the Holy Ghost. That's one of the teachings that's going around today that confuses a lot of people. Amen. Also, avoid any church where... Emotion and confusion rule rather than the Word of God. You may have been in some of them churches. I remember back when I, uh, what I called a, was a Heinz 57. That's why I like to refer to this. I had a little bit of everything. I had a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And I've been into some churches. I said, I don't know what's going on in here. These people act like they're crazy. I wasn't too far off. They did act like they was crazy. The reason was they was full of the devil. That's why. Amen. You know, why is it that we have such a problem with, re uh, you know, coming to the conclusion that there are people all around us that are demon-possessed? 
They're getting quiet in here. Hello. Why is it we have a problem with that? Yet in the Bible speaks about it. Let me tell you something, folks. If you're not saved, you are possessed. <laughs> now, I mean, God deals with people, listen, and the devil deals with people. When you belong to the devil, he's got an open house. He can come on in and fill you up. Amen. And that's it. that demon possession takes a lot of different forms. Some of us have been watching too many of these Hollywood movies, you know, where the guy's holding the cross up and going all this. Get, get, hey, get that stuff out of your mind, you know. That's not what we're talking about. But there are people that are having problems. And the devil does take control of people. And the devil still attacks Christians. He just cannot enter inside you. Not once you've been saved. Now, 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let all things be done decently and in what? Amen. Now Jesus also said, Matthew 15, 8 and 9. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. So we go back to that again. Now the next section deals with one of the most confusing doctrines in the church today. Simple baptism. It's caused more confusion. It's caused more people to have false hopes of going to heaven. It's caused churches to split. It's caused Christians to be at enmity against one another. It's caused so much confusion because of what's being taught. Now, let's take a look. Now that we know what kind of church the Lord wants you in, let's talk about the two ordinances the Lord gave and commanded us to observe as members of His church, the church which is His body. Act 2. Then they that gladly received His word, in other words, they heard the word and got saved, were what? Baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayer, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now folks, to scripturally baptize, one must dip, submerge or immerse under water. Baptism is meant to be a picture or an illustration of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And Jesus was baptized so we could follow Him. You know, when you think about that, you say, well, does Jesus need to be baptized? Not in that sense, no, because he's God. But why did he get baptized? The Bible says to fulfill all righteousness. And he said, I want you to follow me. When you decide to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you ought to be happy and eager and ready to go get baptized right away. Amen. Now, it also pictures our death to sin and our new birth and new life in Christ. Believers' baptism and the Lord's Supper, listen to this now, have no saving power. That's Holy Communion for some of you that didn't recognize when I said the Lord's Supper. Believers' baptism and the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion have no saving power. We must first be saved, born again of the Spirit, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ before we can follow the Lord in believers' baptism or observe the Lord's Supper. We're not qualified to do either one of them unless we've been born again or trusted the Lord personally as our Savior. Now, on page 24, I want you to notice this. Notice no one in the Bible ever got baptized until after they received the Word of God and trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a problem with this time and time because men come here, they are not assured of their salvation, they hear a message here, the Lord gets a hold of them, they make a profession of faith and they get saved, and then when we tell them, say, well, we're having a baptism, they say, oh, I've already been baptized. 
I said, but wait a second. I don't think we're understanding it. I understand what they're saying. They're looking back to a time maybe they're nine or ten years old or whenever and where the church was where they were at. They said, I think it would be a good idea to baptize them. And do you know that there's churches that that's what they consider? That's how you join their church. You just get baptized and they put your name down. And uh, people are thinking they're going to heaven because they joined the church. Or they're going to heaven because uh, he baptized my boy. My boy's all right. He's on the way to heaven. He got baptized. He's not going to heaven because he got baptized. And listen, there's no infant baptism in the Bible. You won't find a baby getting baptized in the Bible. So they ought to stop that nonsense. Babies don't need to be baptized. They don't even know what's going on. And if a baby dies, they don't go to hell. They go to heaven. Amen. God is a fair and just God. Now also, the fact that we'll be following the Lord in the resurrection of the saved and be taken by Him to heaven, home of the saved. Remember, baptism is an act of obedience to Jesus Christ as Lord. Keep in mind, baptism is only for believers. You must be saved before you can be baptized. When you get a chance, you study Romans chapter 6, 1 through 4. Now, you see here, nobody in the Bible ever got baptized until after they received the Word of God and trusted on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Philippian jailer is an example. Paul and Silas got locked up for preaching. That'll probably be coming apart. Hey, you can get locked up in America for preaching. You didn't know that? You go ahead and take that King James Bible down into a governmental building and start saying, Thus saith the Lord. I'm liable to see you at the Doherty County Jail out here. Hello. And you thought you lived in a free nation. Hmm. Not as free as you thought you were, are you? You know what it says? Anyways, this jailer woke up. God had sent an earthquake, opened the doors, the chains fell off, and it looked like everybody was getting ready to go. And the jailer thought that he was going to kill himself. Paul said, don't do that. He said, everybody's here. And the man come on in and said right there, he brought them out and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? He said, well, how, what do I got to do to get saved? Notice what they said on to him. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his. He went home, they preached the gospel to his wife and children, the whole house got saved. Amen? Now, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip was holding the revival and the Holy Spirit told him and said, look, I got a job for you to do. I want you to break this meeting off for a while. There's something real important going on. Here come this eunuch out in the desert going back home. God caught him up, sent him out there. He got up there with the eunuch. And they, they woke him. The Bible is in Isaiah 53. And the eunuch said to him, who's he talking about here? Philip told me he's talking about Jesus Christ. And he preached the gospel to that eunuch. And here in Acts 8, 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Praise the Lord. Now we want to talk about your church membership. Now after you find the right church, which we covered earlier, and you've made your profession of faith, and you've been baptized, you should join that local assembly and start serving the Lord there. Now you may ask yourself, uh, Preacher, when do I need to go to church? <laughs> I mean, I don't like this now. The answer is every time the church has a service. That's when you should be in church. You should be there unless you're ill. Or you have to work. I mean, you have to work. Not by choice, but you know. I'm saying when I say by choice, is when you choose to work. I'm saying you're made to work. That's your job. That's understandable. I suppose that big word is providentially hindered. You know, they use that word. You cannot make it. Or if you're dead. Physically, you couldn't come to the service and amen. <laughs> hey, if you're dead, you're not going to need to worry about a church service. Amen. Because <laughs> you're going to be wherever you was gone by that time. Amen. Now the Bible said, Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. The church is important to God. It should be important to you and me. The Lord Jesus said in Matthew 16.18, Upon this 
rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I don't care what they say. When he said the gates of hell ain't even going to prevail against the church. And by the way, here's that verse now, and you was looking, you said, can I go ahead and have church in my living room? Hello. <laughs> no. No, that's not what God wants you to do. He says right here, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That's us coming together. As the manner of some is. That's the manner of some. They don't want to assemble. But exhorting one another and so much more as ye see the day approaching. Now we must keep in mind, we're not saved by going to church. We're saved in order to go to church. You need to get that, but you know, some people have that, have that problem. Matthew 18, 20. Actually, if, 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 you know, listen, I told you this mission is not a local New Testament church. We're a mission. Uh, we are a ministry of God. Yes, we're, yes, we're very important. I've been called to preach. Uh, I haven't even been ordained by man. That's not important. If God calls you, you better get going. Amen? Now, but the Bible tells us this. You said, well, preach it. Yeah, if I can't get to a church and I want to have a service, and uh, can, I, can I do that? It says where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the what? You can get you, your wife, you, your friend, another person could constitute a called out assembly. The word in Greek is ekklesia, and it means called out assembly. That's what church is. Not a building. It's the people that are in the building that are saved. That's the church. Amen. Now, page 26. The Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. I had somebody ask me today, I was in a Christian bookstore. He didn't quite understand. He says, uh, do you all hold communion down there at the rescue mission? I said, no, sir, we don't. I said, we're not a local New Testament church. What he wanted to do, he had some extra communion stuff that he wanted to give me because the uh, grape juice was turned dark and some of the people that normally get the grape juice didn't like the way it looked. <laughs> Maybe they was a little afraid of it. I, I tried to explain to him that, you know, we didn't have the authority to, to do the Lord's Supper because we're not a New Testament church. But, uh, of course, I told him about our church. I said, they, they may be glad to use it. I don't know. But you know what? i tell you something. Ignorance is one thing, but stupidity is another. I'm going to tell you as we share this, and I'm sure some of you have done the same thing that I did. Before I got saved, I took the Lord's Supper in churches ignorantly. And so did the people that gave it to me, ignorantly. They had no business giving it to me. I wasn't authorized to take it. They weren't authorized to give it to me as an unsaved person, but they didn't even know that. I didn't find this out until after I got saved. Now, no unsaved person has the right to partake in the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. It's for saved people. <laughs> this is an ordinance of the local church. The Lord's Supper was instituted by Jesus the night he was betrayed. This is a memorial of the death of our Lord on the cross. It is a very serious thing to take the Lord's Supper with unconfessed sin in our lives. Amen. Matthew chapter 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Now, folks, before we observe the Lord's Supper, we should examine ourselves to see if there is any unconfessed sin in our lives. This also would mean any bitterness or an unforgiving spirit we may have toward a brother or sister. If so, we must forgive that person and ask them to forgive us. Then we must ask the Lord to forgive us and to cleanse us of our sins. Or we should not take the Lord's Supper. It's a very serious thing. First Corinthians, by the way, Paul explains this. He does it a lot better not to it. Listen to it. 1 Corinthians 11. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. 
Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And he said in verse 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now folks, he wasn't talking about somebody back at the house taking a nap. When he said sleep, he was talking about dead Christians. God had killed some Christians down in the church of Corinth because they was making a mockery out of the Lord's Supper. And they had unconfessed sin in their lives. Now we see that the Corinthians who did this were sick and weak and many had actually suffered death. So it is a very serious thing for you and I. Nobody that's not saved has no right to take the Lord's Supper. Amen. Now the part about confessing our sins. This is interesting because it's very important. We do need to confess our sins. How important it is for you and I to confess our sins to the Lord on a daily basis. There's only one person qualified to forgive you and me of our sins, and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, no little fellow down in the booth at the church house is qualified to abolish your sins. Nobody waving their hand saying, I forgive half the world. He's not qualified. No preacher. Nobody has the right or the authority to forgive sins except God himself. Amen? Now, 1 Timothy 2.5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, Christians still sin. When we do sin, we should confess them immediately. We shouldn't wait for these things to pile up on us. The Bible says these sins will be remembered no more. Hebrews 10, 17, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. In 1 John 1, 7 through 10, In the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now remember, confess your sins to God. You can't confess your sins to the Pope, to Mary. Mary can't forgive you. The preacher can't forgive you. I can't forgive you. I can forgive you if you did something against me, but I can't forgive you of your sins. Only God can do that. Amen. Now the next section, your Bible reading and Bible study. Do you know that the Bible is the Word of God? You say, well, that's what, that's what somebody said. No, the Bible says that. The Word of God claims that. Amen. It is God's revelation to man. Now, you ought to get in the habit of reading your Bible every day. 1 Timothy 3. All Scripture is given by inspiration to God. It didn't say some of this Scripture was. It said all of it. And it's profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now God speaks to us through His Word. Psalms 119.89 Forever, O Lord, Thy Word is settled in heaven. And our faith comes from hearing the Word of God. Remember that verse we covered earlier? Romans 10.17 so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now you should try to read the Bible through every year. If you just read four chapters every day, you'd actually complete it in less than a year. And you know, some folks had not never even read the Old Testament. And they're Christians. They, they, they said, well, I didn't think the Old Testament was for us. The new is the old revealed, by the way. And for you to completely understand the Bible, you better get back at the beginning of the book and go the whole way through. Amen? And what a blessing it is. There's so much. Two-thirds of the Bible actually is in the Old Testament. Amen? It's Jesus from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. Now, it could be said that the Bible is the Christian's owner's manual. I like that. For the body, spirit, and soul. Some of what we learn from the Bible. By the way, if you went down to buy a new car and uh, they didn't give you an owner's manual, you'd probably be disappointed, especially with what you've got to pay for a car nowadays. And then with all this fancy stuff they got on, you about have to have something to show you how to work it. Amen? God got you an owner's manual. 
Amen. Amen. The Bible. The Holy Bible, the Word of God, ought to be the most important book in our life. You should read the Bible before you read anything. The Bible is the only book containing God's prophecy that has never failed. That means God's telling you the future for it ever happens, and He has never missed one. Amen. What gets me is these people go down here to the checkout counter in the Win dixie store, and they'll buy Jane, Jean Dixon's 102 predictions and pay money for that and believe what that woman's trying to pass off on. And if she hits 65% of her predictions, she thinks she's done good. God has never missed one. Amen. Some of the things we learn in the Bible, we learn the way of salvation. That's where John 14, 6 said, Jesus said, I am the way. My church is not the way. My good works is not the way. My living a good life. Hey, God wants you to do all them things. That's not the way of salvation. Jesus died for my sins. Amen. Then we learn what love is all about. John 3:16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. And by the way, you get a chance to read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I call it the charity chapter. That's about real love. Amen. Where do we get wisdom and understanding and instruction? Read the book of Proverbs. You want an education? Get that education. Get you a Bible education. God will tell you how to live your life in Proverbs. He'll tell you what's right and what's wrong. Amen. And I'll tell you what, you read it and it'll show you up for what we are. Hello. <laughs> now we should read the Bible every day. Where do we learn to rejoice and praise the Lord? Psalms. Some of those psalms in there. David, a man after God's own heart, wrote more psalms and praised God. Amen. We ought to praise the Lord. Where do we learn about God's power? At. You want a book of it? Hey. You want to read about the power of the early church? Read the book of Acts. They said those Christians turned the world upside down. They had the power of God on them. You said God still got that kind of power? Yeah. He's got it. But it's sad to say the church today, they don't have the power that they had in the early church. You say, why? There's a lot of reasons why. But God's still the same God. I mean, that power is available. Amen. But there's some things He requires you and I to do to be a disciple. We'll cover that later. Hey, what about the Hall of Faith? I love to read this. You read Hebrews chapter 11. Some of the things that these people went through just to declare that they knew the Lord. I mean, it boggles your mind. Now, how about God's plan for success? Yeah, everybody, hey, everybody here in there, don't you want to be a success? Read, read Psalms 1, 1 through 3. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sin. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his delight doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a river planted by the trees. Hey, I'm telling you, if you'll get into this book, it'll become part of you and you'll become part of it. It lives inside of you. But the, hey, the, hey, the more you read the Bible, the closer you'll get to God because this is God. This is His Word. Somebody said, how do I grow? How do I become spiritual? How do you eat down here at the chow hall? Yeah, you do it like this, don't you? You can look at some of us and tell us we're doing a good job in the eating department. Hello? <laughs> That's physical food. Hey, we need that to live. I got news for you. If you're a Christian, you need this food to live by. Amen. You starve yourself to death spiritually if you don't read God's Word. I don't know how you're ever going to do anything for God apart from reading the Word of God. Or hearing it. Amen. And it comes up. He said, Preacher, what Bible should I use? Doesn't matter. Yeah, it does. Oh, I know you'll really get in an argument over this one. Amen. You know what we need? We need a real Bible. We don't need a paraphrase. We don't need a commentary. And by the way, let us remember the Bible interprets itself. We don't. Did you hear that? The Bible interprets itself. We don't. Now that's important. You better hold on to that right there. The Bible interprets itself. Now this writer, myself, I recommend without exception the authorized King James Version as the most trustworthy translation. I use it only the authorized King James Version when I preach. I preach out of it. I teach out of it. And when I read it, I read the King James. And when I study, I use the King James Bible. 
Now, I've never, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I've never looked at another version. From time to time I do because I want to see how they changed it. That's what I'm interested in. I want to know what they took away and what they added. Amen. Now be careful how much you rely on a commentary though. Since these are the thoughts of men commenting on the Bible. Amen. Now, I also suggest the original Schofield Reference Bible as the best reference Bible. I do not agree with every footnote, but it is still the best available. The Rice Reference Bible is also a good reference Bible. And I recommend Strom's Concordance as a study aid. And then Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary for the scriptural meaning of the English words. Now let us be careful to compare scripture to scripture in our daily Bible study. 2 Corinthians 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now we are commanded to study to show ourselves approved, not to man, but unto who? God. Now if you see there on page 31, God's tithe and your giving as a Christian. Oh, this is an area where a lot of people get a, oh, they have a problem with this. Now, the first thing we must realize about the tithe is it does not belong to us. It belongs to God. The tithe means the tenth. So if you do not tithe, or you take it and spend it, you are robbing God, and the Bible says you have a curse on you. You said, you mean to tell me Christians can have a curse on them? Yes, they can. Now, this is another area where some Christians have a problem. Malachi 3. Will a man rob God? That was the question asked. Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me this whole nation. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Now as a saved Christian, and a member of a local New Testament church, you should put the tithe in that local church to help support the Lord's work there. Now you know somebody may say, you know I can't afford to tithe, but actually the truth is you can't afford not to tithe as a Christian. And by the way, you cannot outgive the Lord. You trust Him in your giving, listen now, and He will pour you out a blessing because the Bible says so. Now you must realize the tithe is the least you should do. Now, actually, you haven't given the Lord anything till you give above the tithe. These are referred to as offerings or love offerings. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Hi, if you're sitting there tonight and you say, Preacher, I'm not 100% sure I'm going to heaven, I'd like to invite you to bow your head now and I'll lead you in a prayer that where you can trust Jesus as your personal Savior. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I believe you died for my sins. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.